This is Trip Wire with a special podcast, The Impact of COVID-19 from the legal and regulatory point of view. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS, Commercial Real Estate and CLO Markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and joining us today is Rick Jones, partner and co-chair of Deckert's Global Finance and Real Estate Practice Groups, which focus on sophisticated capital markets and mortgage finance transactions. We are frequently here at TREP asked to compare the recession uh, event today to the Great Recession. What's your take on that? Well, it's, 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 it's the question everyone asks because, you know, we always want to be able to look back on history to sort out what the future holds. And uh, as we all know, um, um, you know, the plans of the best generals uh, never survive contact with the enemy and um, the, the, the future rarely reflects the past. Um, it, I think is happening today is we rolled uh, three years of rolling, grinding, economic distress into about 30 days. Um, you know, we've had, we've, you know, 10, 10 weeks is 10 months right now. Uh, we're, we're, we're moving so rapidly through this crisis. Um, now that may make us feel like we're closer to the end, but that may also be a false expectation. Uh, but certainly, you know, we've seen trends in retail and multifamily and office um, and industrial all accelerated uh, by this pandemic. And the last recession, as I remember several prior recessions, and there was quite a while after the Great Recession became something that was a thing that we understood, that we all kind of sat around and stared at each other and nothing much happened. Um, and uh, virtually everything's happening at light speed compared to that this time through. And you know, maybe it means we get out of this faster. Uh, it's, a, it's a hope. Rick, out of um, every challenging time we have in the CRE and CMBS market, something new emerges, some kind of new regulatory um, edict or some kind of structuring nuance. What do you see coming out of this crisis once we emerge at the other end? Well, we're starting to talk about CMBS 4.0. Um, um, uh, as investors who picky have begun to think about what they like in their structures and what they don't like, and I think we'll undoubtedly see some structural changes in both the CRE CLO and the SASB space. Um, um, the conduit space may be less impacted, uh, but is in, is in deep recession right now. Um, in all this, this federal largesse, um, which is all based on theory, of course, and you know, when you say you get five economists, you get at least six theories, and you know, wh whether the theory that is that is the the sort of the current uh, received wisdom that pumping all this liquidity into the system is going to be an unrelieved good uh, or not is not at all clear um, uh, we you know we've got the PPP we've got the 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 tarp we have oh, the Main Street lending programs and now there's something called the hope act that's floating around um, and w whether that will be good or not whether that achieves its intended goal um, uh, or not is not clear. And, you know, if we come out of this, um, do you, do you simply assert that that was the cause of the fix or is that just a coincident indicator? Um, and with all that in the system, you know, what's it mean for us in the out years after we restored some level of economic success to the economy? Have we finally baked in that, that inflation that we've been worried about for the past 10 years and never, um, it, it, and soon to be told, I guess. How has this flash recession impacted the type of work that you're doing? So give me an idea of what your work was like before the pandemic and afterward. Well, what's, what's, um, what's new, of course, is that we returned to our roots as workout lawyers, and we've probably done 400 uh, pre-negotiation agreements um, over the past uh, uh, eight weeks. And um, you know, we've, we're deeply involved in uh, dozens and dozens of single asset, single borrower deals that are wobbling or have collapsed, in fact. Um, and we're going to test all those documents we drafted all those years ago to see if they actually do work. Um, you know, I've always said in a, in a downturn, there's, there's rarely bad assets, there's just bad pricing. And um, a lot of assets are going to be repriced, uh, which is going to cause winners and losers. Um, we may be in an unusual situation here from our practice point of view that uh, we'll see renewed capital formation. And we've seen the SASB market beginning to hot up again. 
Um, we've seen interest in doing a wide range of securitization transactions. And we may be doing that at the exact same time we're seeing a, bo a boom in workout business. So we're sort of expecting to see a lot of restructured assets, uh, a lot of need to reprice and, and, and um, uh, change the ownership of assets. There'll be a lot of winners and losers. Um, and uh, that's, that's, that could be really tough on the losers and really great for the winners. Um, but, um, um, you know, we're transactional junkies. And as long as the market is moving, we're fundamentally sort of happy. Um, and Rick, at this point, you know, as somebody who's had a seat at the table for a lot of these conversations, um, do you feel like there's an equilibrium about to hit between borrowers and special servicers? Or has that equilibrium been elusive thus far in terms of what constitutes the right amount of relief, forbearance, um, you know, that type of thing? And, and does it differ by property type? Yeah, it does. I mean, there, you know, there was, um, you know, the, the GSE showed leadership on forbearance. Um, the, the, the private label market has um, really struggled with what their documents require, but what the broader polity may require. And I think many people in our business uh, remember getting dragged in front of congressional committees to tell congressmen why they're such horrible people um, and are concerned about that as we, as we look at the backside of this recession. Um, what we've seen is, as you all have reported and you're a great source of information, is that um, um, uh, your great source of information is that, is that more people have paid more money than we expected. Um, and, you know, I think I, among others, thought back in April, you know, we're going to see this tsunami of, of defaults. It never really happened. Uh, and maybe it's now July. Maybe July is the, is the payment period in which we'll see significant distress. Uh, but, you know, the underlying economics of these assets is not getting better very fast. And the ability of the borrowers to pay um, is going to run out. And, you know, uh, what, what Warren Buffett famously said, that when the tide goes out, you see who's wearing Speedos. And I think we're going to see an awful lot of assets um, as the economy returns to some sort of regular order, simply not perform. Um, and we're going to have to deal with that. When you talk about going down to Congress in, in the last Great Recession, um, there's a lot of talk right now about uh, bailout. A lot of it seems to circle around hotels at this point. Um, do you have an opinion on whether that would be helpful or not helpful? What uh, a bailout might look like? And is there any evidence that uh, at this point, the hope for a bailout is stalling negotiations between borrowers and special servicers as people are waiting for that Hail Mary pass? Yeah, I don't think we're gonna see a Hail Mary. I think that um, it's the, the hospitality industry is working extremely hard to bring their issues to Congress and explain the importance of that issue, those their concerns, both for the industry itself and for employment, which is a key issue for, for Congress. But gosh, it seems like we're starting to run out of energy around bailouts. Um, um, and it's awfully easy in this time and place to conflate you know, good economic policy for um, anti-progressive behavior um, uh, for, you know, unfortunately, uh, the president's United States family owns a couple of hotels. And that is, a, that, is that may be a fatal flaw in the hospitality industry's efforts to get, to get something sorted out. So um, I just don't see a lot more bailouts coming. Um, it would certainly it'd be terrific for the hospitality industry which I think is going to struggle for years. It's hard to see, you know, it's hard to see where they're going. If you, if you could see the other side of the ocean, you could sort of make a very good case for help us get there. But when you can't see the opposite shore, you have no idea how long this is going on. It's tough to make a case to, you know, put money into an industry that may not return to successful the ordinary course in its current format. You know, in, in the past, the relief has come, at least for the CMBS market, in the form of buying CMBS bonds and reintroducing liquidity to the market. That happened, obviously, 12 years ago, and it's happened in the last uh, six to eight weeks or so, um, once again, by the Fed. The Fed pointed out recently that, you know, they can't just put money themselves in the pockets of hotel owners that has to take a, a different form. They can't uh, put that you know, liquidity into hotel operators' hands. Some have suggested that um, 
using med lo MES loans that the U.S. government would own that would put cash in the hands of uh, borrowers, uh, kind of bypassing the Fed. Is that something that under REMIC rules that we could pull off, or is that just off the table and would take a real heavy lift for somebody to pull that off? Well, you know, our, uh, you know in, in the CMBS environment, and of course, in a lot of portfolio environments, there are restrictions on um, additional debt, which is effectively MES. On the other hand, you know, when PPP arrived, I was arguing with a lot of folks saying, it's essentially free money, we need to find a way to take it. Um, I'm guessing that if, if government backed MES dollars um, under current documentation were made available, uh, a lot of the mortgage community would find a way to make it work. Um, but once again, it's a question of, you know, is, is it a bridge or is it a, is it a peer? And to the extent it's a peer, then it's hard to see why we we'll get too excited about it. If it's a bridge, the question is, is it a bridge to what? Um, you know, I can be surprised. I, I don't pretend, I don't even, I don't even play a policy um, uh, Washingtonian type on television. So I, I, I don't really know what the chances of this additional bailout money uh, showing up is. It just seems to me as we get further into it and we get closer to the election on the new, and this political season that, that getting Congress to get behind something uh, other than maybe relief for um, um, the renter community is, is a, is a stretch. I think if there's, if there's a bail, if there's a, if there's a bill that might have some success is, is some relief for, for um, renters in multifamily apartment complexes. That's, that's a possibility. The rest strikes me as just a bridge too far and too easy to conflate with the notion that the government is taking care of the 1% um, uh, at the expense of the rest of the country. Yes, we, we've heard the same uh, from other uh, listeners to our own podcast as well. So um, that, that's come up several times. Uh, as you know, as, as a veteran in the industry, the CMBS market came out of the crisis uh, of the late 80s and early 90s, the banking uh, crisis that really wiped out commercial real estate lending back then uh, with Nomura and, and First Boston Solomon leading the way with uh, new lending coming out of the crisis after the RTC. Uh, do you see certain winners coming out of this environment in terms of picking up market share? Uh, does it benefit insurance companies over banks or banks over CMBS in your mind? I, we, well, certainly there's going to be winners and losers. There's, no, there's nothing like a crisis to, to shake out winners and losers. Harder to tell in advance who it will be. It's hard to see the insurance industry expanding its footprint. They, their, their production of, of mortgage assets is, is pretty huge by historical standards already. Um, the commercial banks, I think, are under, under pressure. Um, to restrict commercial real estate lending, which I, I think is going to, if, it, if there's a winner here, it will be um, providing more opportunities for the alternate lending space, the space that's that's funded directly out of the capital markets. You know, I remember during the, the time of the last election, I had my blog already for life on, in the Hillary administration. I had to throw it away when we were all surprised on election day. I've, I've kind of dusted it off. Um, and, and it, we're, we're so fascinated with the pandemic, we're, we're in some ways we're, we're paying as very little attention to the fact that we have a massively um, important election coming up, which might significantly impact our business. Um, but I, I, I sort of see coming out of the pandemic and through the next election cycle with, with I think the, the smart money, which seems reasonable to me as a democratic administration is, is you know, more pressure on the banks and therefore more opportunities for the alternate lending space. Uh, there's a lot of money out there um, ready to put, be put to work. Right now, the problem in, in capital formation is the, uh, there's been so little price discovery that the borrowers can still pretend their assets are worth what they were. And they can still pretend that the spreads they paid for uh, back in January 2020 should be the spreads they pay today. And it's just not real. And that, that great divide will have to collapse um, as borrowers and lenders find market clearing prices. Uh, but it's probably got a while to run before it does. I'm sort of thinking, you know, fourth quarter into the first of next year before everyone reconciles themselves to the new price point. Uh, you're a prolific blogger and uh, an entertaining one, I would add. We look forward to your credit crunched uh, insights all the time. When can we expect uh, 
your insights into the forthcoming election. Is that uh, coming up soon or is that something that's a few months away? Well, I, I am, I'm working on, on, on an article now um, thinking about this whole issue of, of what's the next uh, bunch of black swans. The, the, the pond seems so full right now, it's hard to imagine. But, but I think the election, um, if, as the pollsters suggest, turns into a blue landslide of some sort, Will be, will be hugely consequential to our industry. And when you tack that on to the back of a pandemic that, that was a complete accelerant to every underlying trend in commercial real estate we've ever seen, um, it suggests to me that, that, that's, that 2021 is gonna look a lot different. And then of course, as soon as we get done with that, LIBOR goes away on January 1, 2022, uh, which is another issue that sort of disappeared in the in the in, in the tidal wave of fascination with the pandemic, um, and we're going to wake up to that sometime late in in 2020 and realize it's 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 little more than a year away. Uh, that I also think is going to have a significant impact on our business. When I was a kid, my father used to say, "There's going to be consequences." There will be consequences. Um, <laughs> Look, I think you know we, we are unfortunately um, part of an industry that uh, has uh, a certain amount of, of political baggage um, in this progressive era. Um, it it is it has been a whipping boy for right or wrong. I mean, it's been a whipping boy, and um, where this where the politics are going coming out of the pandemic suggests it's going to be again, and that's going to have significant impacts on how this business works. There will be consequences, as your dad used to say. I think that's fair. Um, in addition to being a, uh, uh, a counselor for the, for the industry and on uh, many different sides of the, of the industry, you're also a tenant uh, for the commercial industry. You have a big swath of space uh, in Midtown Manhattan, as do many law firms in New York. You know, how do you see this impacting your spatial needs going forward and how has the uh the current situation changed your thinking and, and that of your colleagues boy we're struggling like everyone else is uh, you know I, i'm still staring at those elevators and figuring out how we get the staff up into the space even if we can socially distance in the space you know it's it's um certainly the the um, um the immediate reaction to the pandemic is we're all going to work from home no one's going to go back to the offices we'll all need smaller footprints I'm not really sure that's the case. And if any of my landlords are listening, please um, turn, turn the show off right now. But, you know, it, it could be that the countervailing considerations of distancing, social distancing, that I think are going to be part of our world for at least the next half decade um, might be, a, might be an, in, in contravention of the trend to have less space because we have less people working in our space every day. So, you know, uh, it could be that, that we end up with the same type of footprints we have now, just highly reconfigured space. Um, I think this is with us for a long time. I don't think anyone's going to want to sit on a trading desk, um, you know, six inches from their, their buddies um, for many years to come. You know, one of the questions that Joe McBride, who's not with us today, but he's with us in spirit, uh, wanted us to ask is about Cecil, which is an area that's uh, close to his heart. He's worked with a number of clients on uh, Cecil preparation with the CARES Act that was delayed. So I was curious, is that another area that you're going to see kicked down the road until people have uh, a focused attention on it? Yeah, I think that's, um, and I wrote an article called Beanie and Cecil a while back, and Joe and I have had lots of good conversations about it. Uh, uh, Cecil's terrific for um, um, vendors and I think not good for the industry as a whole. Um, as you know, the Cecil concept, to be a little facetious, is, is you take your losses when you book your loans, whereas most of our clients would say, gee, I didn't expect to book a loss when I made a loan. I thought I was making money, not losing it. Um, and Cecil is part of that suite of, of rules that add capital on top of capital on top of capital um, in an effort to make the banking system safer and an understandable um, uh, 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 goal in some respects. But um, every time you increase capital, you decrease capital efficiency, you decrease capital formation. And uh, it's off the table at the moment, but my expectation is in a democratic administration, um, uh, that we may see much of that Basel product uh, brought forward again uh, on the notion that the banks need to be carefully tended 
uh, if we're going to let them um, uh, help the economy grow and a notion that left to their own devices, that the banks are not trustworthy counterparties to a government trying to protect the citizens. So I'm expecting more Cecil problem later on. So don't throw your Cecil handbooks away. I think it's going to be coming back before we're done. Uh, that brings me to a, a related question, which I, which I didn't really think about until you started talking about banks and their capital and the rules that went into um, producing Cecil. Um, are there things system systemically that you think that the market is not seeing at this point, right? Back in 2008, we talked a lot about systemic risk, and that's what everybody worried about, GE not being able to tap the commercial paper market and derivatives taking down the likes of AIG and others and how that might have a domino effect. Is there something out there right now that, you know, is keeping you awake at night that you said that you say to yourself, if this comes to pass, we're going to have bigger problems than, than people even imagine. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, we've all learned that there, that, that as a certainty, there are things there that are going to go wrong that we don't know about. I guarantee that something is going to bite us in the rump before we're done here. You know, the, the, I worry, I don't think many people do, it's hardly an original thought, there's, there's $300, $300 trillion of counterparty risk in the floating rate market. Um, it's the market we're thinking about, it's a LIBOR market. Uh, you know, there's a massive amount of credit transfer going on and no one really knows where it is and where it's concentrated and what happens when we unwind. Um, that was a significant problem during the Great Recession. It, it took the underlying um, you know, fuse that was burning in the subprime market and, and essentially brought the higher capital markets almost to its knees. And that's still there. I mean, there's, there's, some, there's some control of trading in the, in, the, in the synthetic market, but there's a lot of still face-to-face -face bilateral trading in that marketplace. And, and you know, if, if there's somewhere which could erode capital quickly, that's probably where it lies. So we asked this question of a number of the experts we talked to, so we're going to have to ask you, um, what shape is the recovery? Yeah. I think it's the best description I've had is the square root. I think that we went down rapidly, went down rapidly. We started coming up and we're going to get stuck on the way up and then it's going to flatten out. So I, I think it's a square root. And look, you know, if, if I knew what the medicine was really all about and what the, what the biologic consequences of this was, I'm sure I'd be smarter and probably doing something else. Um, but, you know, Assuming that what we see is what we get, that, you know, sort of Occam's razor, the obvious answer is the answer that's most likely to be true. I think we're going to get somewhere back and then it's going to stall. And I, I see a, a multi-year stall here um, because we're going to have to root out all of these mispriced assets. Because, you know, until we get through that mispricing, um, until we unwind the mispricing, we can't really grow again. And I think that mispricing could take a while. This next question may an annoy some of our, our clients, but I always thought Deckard had uh, the best party in South Beach at Crefcy every January. So Warren, the uh, topic of predictions, when do you think you throw the next party in South Beach now that you say that the, uh, uh, the recovery may be years away? Yeah, we're almost as good at, at South Beach parties as we are at providing legal services to our clients. Almost, not quite. Um, <laughs> Well, I hope so. You know, I've been talking to my friends about coming back to Manhattan. And I said, I'll be there just as soon as I can take you to lunch at San Pietro. And we both feel okay about doing that. And I'm wondering when that's going to be. Um, I think the Crest Sea January conference is still on the calendar. Um, and we will, and if, if it is a real thing, um, I'm sure we will, we will take advice internally as to whether we're comfortable being there. But I certainly hope to God it is, because I think we're all going slightly mad in isolation. And it's certainly not good for relationships, capital formation, the, the, our industry to not be able to get together. And the tech, thank God this happened after the technology got okay. Can you imagine if this had happened five or seven years ago? I mean, it'd be a complete disaster. Um, and so we've had the benefit of at least mostly working technology um, to keep us somewhat connected. But, you know, it's easier for some of the older people in the industry to connect because we've had so many years of knowing each other in person so you can pick up the phone. But for the younger folks who don't have that vast sea of experience behind them, it's, it's really tough right now. So here's knock on wood that I can buy you a drink um, 
in South Beach here in, um, in January. Had your firm mastered the remote closing before the COVID problem, or is this something that you had to pick up on the fly in the last 10 weeks? Well, we've gotten way better at it. I mean, and uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about electronic signatures and the like. But, you know, the, the days, you know, I, I am old enough to remember when we had a closing, we'd all gather in a, in a stuffy conference room and eat bad food and, and hang around for, for 30 hours at a time and then close. And, and actually, it was some ways it was quite good because we all got to know each other. I knew who my colleagues' children were and what they did and what they were doing for the weekend. Um, we haven't done that in years. I mean, the last time I sat around a conference table to do a real live closing was when the GE portfolio was sold to Blackstone and Wells. And I was representing Wells and we all got together and hunkered down in a conference suite for a week. Um, we don't do that anymore. And uh, I think it's, um, it, it made it easier to make this transition, but um, in some way it's fundamentally kind of annoying. You recently interviewed Sam Zell on iGlobal, which uh, sounded like a, a good interview. And you wrote about it in your blog, Crunch Credit. Give me an idea. What was the secret that you didn't share with us uh, that he gave you? Yeah, I see. I asked him. I said, Sam, you know, it's just you and me here. You know, tell me, tell me when I should be starting to really aggressively move back into the distressed debt space. And, you know, he essentially said, I'm looking at the same data you are. Maybe I'm just smarter. Um, <laughs> so that was my advice to my readers is, uh, you know, stare at the data, but keep an eye on Sam because he's a pretty good tell for when things um, might be ready for um, um, a real distressed debt opportunity. He did say he has four and a half billion dollars of capital sitting there waiting to be used. And, um, you know, he, he did earn his uh, title of grave dancer, honestly. Um, so I, I suspect he's going to be um, looking at opportunities. I, I just uh, dusted off my, my um, liquidating trust documents from 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, because I think we're going to see that technology used to accumulate broken assets, broken toys, as I call them, and get some lever, a modest level of lever against those assets and go through a process of, of, of repricing and reowning uh, or, or distributing those to new owners uh, who can enjoy those assets at new lower prices. Um, I have one more for you, Rick. We've been talked here. about this a couple times uh, on the podcast before. Handicap for us. Um, how the force majeure plays out and, you know, who wins that battle, right? We had a big uh, industry shift back in post 9-11 when there was insurance debates over who had liability over, um, you know, is it one terrorist act, two terrorist acts, and now we have a whole new legal structure around, you know, who deserves, uh, you know, business interruption payments as a result of mall closings, hotel closings, et cetera. Uh, are you in a position to handicap for that for us yet, or is it still way too early? Well, I think, well, a couple of observations. There, there actually is some force majeure clauses that do talk about pandemics. So those are easy. That's, that's, that's pretty straightforward because I, no, matter, no matter what you think, I think we could characterize this as a pandemic. Um, most of them don't. Um, I think it's going to be years before we know the answer. But right now, you know, it's if I'm in court and the little guy's getting screwed by the big guy, you know, um, I've got a feeling the little guy's going to win more than their fair share. But um, we'll be reading uh, force majeure cases uh, in a year beginning with a three on it, I think. <laughs> That's great. Well, with that, we'll close this special podcast. Thank you to our guest, Rick. Thanks to our producer, Keegan St. Anjame. Join us later this week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, send us an email at podcast at trep.com or look for our Twitter poll for topics. Until then, visit trep.com for more info and subscribe to the Trepwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay